All right. Welcome to the real-time communications track of DevConf this year, where we're having three talks in a row about related subjects. And the first one by Daniel Pocock here. Um, and while we're on the subject of real-time communication, I'd just like to thank gradwell.com, who have provided the free calls out of the conference on my desk phone, which uh, if you haven't taken advantage of, well, you need to do that before the network goes away. Um, also involved in the track is uh, Zafir Cohen and two other people whose names I was told about 30 seconds ago and I've now forgotten. You can do the rest. Okay. Um, so welcome to Vomaku um, and DebConf. Um, who, who's just come down for the day? Yeah. Yeah, some visitors, yeah. And... Um, Who's been to one of my DebConf talks before? Yep, a couple of people. Okay. So this afternoon we've got a whole track on real-time communications. Um, so I'm going to start with an introduction and then um, Zafri is going to help with some discussion about Asterisk in Debian. Um, Catalan has been participating in the Google Summer of Code He's going to go through some things with SIP conferencing and WebRTC. And we'll get back to what WebRTC is in a little bit. Um, and finally, we'll finish off with um, Emil Ivov from Jitsi. Um, who's heard of Jitsi? Yeah, so free Java soft phone um, supports SIP and Jabber and other protocols. It's actually been around for many years. Um, so he's the founder of the Jitsi project. It's one of the most um, heavily developed open source soft phones. Um, it's been very successful, so it's really good to have Emil down at DebConf today. Um, in February, we gave a similar presentation at FOSDEM in Brussels. Um, and we spoke about the importance of, of free software for free communications. Um, a lot of people say to me, uh, I've got this thing called Skype and it's free. Um, I say, no, it's not. Um, because we have a different definition of free. And Skype doesn't quite fit that definition. Um, and so we've had some help um, explaining that in the last few weeks. Um, so the help has come from the NSA that they've published thousands of documents revealing how they monitor solutions that are not free. Um, and so people are more aware of this topic than at any time before. I certainly found that the interest in my websites, like the Lumicall website and the RTC Kickstart, they doubled overnight when the, um, when the NSA started to be documented in a, in a public domain. Um, just by coincidence, on the, the 5th of June, in the evening, I published a blog about uh, the gold standard in free communications. Um, I'll see if I can bring that up on the projector without losing everything else. No. So that was on the 5th of June. And then the next morning, we had this. <laughs> um, so all of a sudden, there's a lot of attention on this topic. And it just came out of nowhere. I knew nothing about this. It was just coincidence. But, um, but a lot of people then started saying, you know, why have you been talking about this? Why is this important? Um, why has it been on, on your blog or at FOSTEM? Um, so, so it is a, an important topic at the moment. Um, just this week, we've seen it's, it's not just the NSA. I mean, we, it's not fair to, to be unreasonable with our American friends. I mean, here in London, the rubbish bins are out to get you. Um, these rubbish bins are monitoring the, um, the MAC addresses of your Wi-Fi devices, like your, your mobile phone, as you walk around the street. And they have them everywhere. Um, 
except you can't find a rubbish bin on the London Underground, so you have to carry your rubbish with you if you go there. But in the streets, you'll find these everywhere, and they've been gathering everyone's movements, who you associate with or who is in the same proximity on a regular basis, where you go to eat, those types of things. Um, so these things are widespread. They happen in different technologies and in different countries. And and if the opportunity is there, it seems there will be someone who will look to find a commercial you know, <laughs> possibility with that. So we've seen the, the statement from Google this week that the users should not expect that when they send an email to a Gmail account, they should not expect that that is a private communication. And that was in a court document that they're using in their defence. Um, Skype, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say so much about it. I don't, I don't think I need to. Um, uh, mobile networks around the world, we've seen similar patterns and... Is there anything left that users can trust? Well, there is. It's been 20 years in the making. Um, a solution that had anticipated these problems from the beginning. And of course, I'm, I'm talking about Debian. I'm talking about free software. And it's not just Debian. Um, you know, Richard Stallman's been talking about this for years, even before Debian started. Um, other people have been talking about the need for free um, software, for transparency. Um, if your software is not free, if you don't have the source code, how can you know what, what's in there? How can you know that your software is not the next iteration of that London rubbish bin, that it's got something in there to monitor you? Um, But it, it actually goes a step further. It's, a, it's an existential issue for the free software community. Um, the free software and free communications are linked. Uh, that as long as people have this peer pressure to use a, a technology that their friends are using, that they want to talk to their partner, they want to talk to their parents, they want to talk to their friends, and their friends insist on a proprietary solution, then that's a real challenge for us because then they want to change their, their whole way of computing. They want to run a, a closed operating system that can run this closed communication system. And, th and that undermines a lot of our work in other areas, whether it's free presentation software or free email software or free web browsers. All of these suffer at the hands of closed communication software that's supposedly free. Um, the peer pressure is probably stronger with communication software than with any other type of software that I've just mentioned. Okay? Someone's not going to have pressure from their partner to change their accounting software or to change their email program. You can use any email program to communicate with anyone else. But when you want to talk to someone or to, to see them with the webcam, um, I mean, that's a, a personal connection, there will be pressure there. And, and a lot of people will not argue with that and they will try the proprietary solution. And then once they start using it, it's hard to get them away from that. Um, another issue is this, um, um, question of why didn't people just abandon services like Gmail when all of this news came out? Um, there's been no statistics, of course. Um, there's none of these companies will want to say, oh, look, all our users are running away. Um, but certainly, I see just as many emails from people using these services as I was saying before. So people are continuing to use them, even though they know that they've got holes in them. So people don't appreciate the individual risk. Like if you, if you were out in, in Manawa for DebConf 12, you wouldn't walk down the street with a big expensive camera in one hand and laptop in the other hand. 
um, because you can appreciate the risk of doing that. And with no disrespect to the people of Nicaragua, but there were situations there where people were challenged about their security. Um, but when it comes to email, people have no perception of any threat whatsoever. When it comes to telephone calls um, or just maintaining a list of your friends on a social network, people have no value on that, that they just put it there and they leave it all hanging out like a expensive camera hanging over your shoulder. Um, but with all this attention on the subject, there's never been a better time to be promoting free software solutions. Um, so who, who wants to get started to, to run open source communication software? Yep, okay. So what's the strategy to do this? I mean, I mean, obviously, if, if people were keen on this, they would have all done it already. Everyone would have free software. So we've got, to, we've got a gap there, and we've got to bridge that. And so I've, I've documented a strategy here. And it's fairly straightforward. Um, one of the first things to look at is the federation. It's how we can interact between our domains, just like we do with email. Um, SIP and Jabber are the two common protocols for voice over IP and multimedia communications, and they both support federation. Some versions of the software that you might have tried before did not support federation very well or very securely, but that has improved in the last 12 months. Certainly with Debian 7, with Wheezy, you have federated SIP and federated Jabber in the standard stable packages. Um, the next thing is to get around NAT. Who's ever had a attempt to make a call with a soft phone and they've had audio or video in just one direction? Yeah, it's a common problem. Um, and one of the reasons for that is the NAT, um, that firewalls and NAT devices are blocking something in one direction and the software doesn't know how to deal with it. Um, there was no standard solution and for quite some time, manufacturers are actually making routers and other devices that would try to help you. It's just each one would try to help in a different way. And they'd end up fighting with each other and making the problem worse. Um, then a standard came along, and that's called TURN. TURN provides a mechanism for relaying video, voice, and all other types of streams and sockets in a range of scenarios. Um, so that's going to be part of the solution. Um, Running both SIP and Jabber. Some of the people you want to speak to will be using Jabber and some of them will be using SIP. Um, you know, we have a lot of these hardware devices out there and they're predominantly SIP devices, very few Jabber devices. Um, there are a lot of very good um, chat products that people have on their desktop or on their laptop or on their mobile phone and most of those are Jabber based. Um, the user identifiers, which is basically like your email address, can be interchangeable between SIP and Jabber. So the only thing that we have to keep in mind is we have to run something like a dual stack. It's like running IPv4 and IPv6 at the same time. We have to run both of them to be successful, to maximize the probability that you can get any call to anybody through either of these protocols. Because if the other person only has one of these, but you have both, then chances are your call will succeed and you'll continue using free software. Um, the final thing is to attack from every mode of communication. We can now do this from a web browser with no plugin required. If you have a blog, if you have a small business website, or you have a contact form and you have your phone number, you can now put a JavaScript control and a little bit of HTML, and people can call you as long as they have the new browser. They don't need to install anything. They'll just get a little prompt to agree to let your website use their microphone and potentially their webcam. Um, mobile devices, the fastest growing form of internet access by far. Um, most of them now are Android, which is Linux based, which is great. Um, there's a number of options for real-time communications with SIP and Jabber on Android. So that's part of the picture, um, that tapping into those options and providing 
Debian infrastructure to act as a server for those apps is another way we can move forward. Um, and hard phones. Some people just feel comfortable with a physical phone. Um, it looks like the phone that they have now that's monitoring them, but it's better. Um, so, so just putting these phones into the homes of people that you communicate with that won't use a computer can be very powerful. So just looking more closely at TURN for NAT busting, um, a single TURN server instance will support both your SIP and your Jabber users. So you don't have to set up multiple TURN servers. It's independent of these protocols. Um, it supports various things like tunneling through HTTPS. So if you're hoping to receive calls from people that are on corporate networks where their internet access is tightly restricted and their only access is using a proxy and they can proxy HTTPS, they can use TURN. Uh, so setting up your TURN server to listen for port 443 can be very powerful. Um, it's a standard feature in the WebRTC protocol. So for anyone developing any of these WebRTC solutions, whether they're doing it with SIP over WebRTC or whether it's um, some proprietary solution, Turn is still um, a part of that solution. It's in the browser itself. It's not in the JavaScript. Um, and there are three turn servers in Debian. One of them, the return server in Reciprocate, is in Stable, in Wheezy. Um, the open turn server from Jitsi, and there's the RFC 5766 turn server project. They're both in unstable, and I believe they've migrated to testing. Um, so there are three compelling solutions. If one doesn't work for you, there's a good chance that another of those solutions will work. Um, all of the communities are very active, and they're helping with bugs on those packages. So, so you can't go wrong choosing a turn server. Um, setting up a SIP proxy as a first step. Um, a lot of people have heard of Asterisk or FreeSwitch, and they've tried to start there, and they're, they're great products, um, but they have a lot of bells and whistles. Um, and sometimes that can make the project a lot more complicated to begin with. So the advice I normally give people is if you want to get federated quickly, and if you just want to start trying this out, just set up a basic SIP proxy. Um, it doesn't have voicemail. It doesn't have queues, it doesn't have all these other fancy applications. It's just a way for people to call each other, but it will support federation and you can add in uh, PBX such as Asterisk or FreeSwitch later on. They can work as an extension to your proxy. Um, so there are two popular choices and they're both packaged in Debian. One is the Repro from Reciprocate uh, and the other is Camillo. Um, both of these solutions support TLS, which is quite important for federation now. Um, they support WebRTC, and they support the federation itself, so routing calls between domains. A lot of older solutions would just work in a local domain. They were trying to replace an office phone system. They were not meant to go out on the public internet, and if they did, they would often find themselves with a very big bill. <laughs> so. These solutions hopefully won't leave you in that scenario. Because they're so simple, um, it's easier to understand what you're deploying and hopefully make it secure. The next step is the Jabber server. So once again, it's important to start with something simple. Um, I use the eJabberD. It's based on Erlang. Um, it's very stable. Um, it has a web interface where you can set up users. It can work with your LDAP if you have one to authenticate people with a single password. Um, so it's very convenient, very quick. You can often set that up in uh, maybe an hour. And they're, they're both of these solutions are packaged, so you, you don't have to compile anything or whatever. Um, taking it further, so once you've got all of those things in place, then it's a good time to look at more advanced solutions. And I've listed some of them here. 
Um, a soft PBX. Let's say you do want voicemail, you do want cues, you want to have a, um, a menu system where people are prompted to who they want to speak to. Um, that then you will have to look at putting in a soft PBX. And you can connect those solutions to your existing proxy. You don't have to replace the proxy, rather you connect them together. If you want to do conferencing, you can use a soft PBX to do that, or you can use a standalone conferencing server. And Catalin will talk about that in the next session. Um, the other direction you might want to go is with uh, Jabba, which is formerly XMPP. Um, there are a number of solutions now to rival Facebook um, and Twitter for social networking features. Um, but once again, these are a, a next step. After you get your basic Jabber server running, after your users have a user ID and that they're able to chat, then you can look at these things coming in later. But they are there and they're, they're also packaged in Debian or they're open source and you can get your hands on them and try them out. Um, So that's, that's all of the slides. So here are some of the packages that I've provided already for voice over IP. And there's a few others in the list as well. Um, with Drupal, um, I've been working through the packaging of JavaScript so that we can make a, a WebRTC control that is dropped in like any other Drupal module. Uh, so then anybody running a Drupal blog, and there are millions of them out there, can just add a WebRTC calling feature on their blog just as easily as they can add a, a web form with email. Uh, when someone asks them, you know, do you want to talk to me with with Skype, for example? They can say, no, just come to my blog and talk to me with that. It's not only good for putting the proprietary solutions aside, but it also helps people to raise the profile of their, their websites, their blogs, um, or whatever their preferred you know, online identity might be. So if you're running a business, you want to get people to come to your business website. You don't want them to register their details with a third party if you can avoid it. Um, some of the other solutions we've got here, Reciprocate, of course. Um, so I also work on the upstream development of Reciprocate, um, <laughs> particularly the WebRTC code. So if anyone has any questions about that, feel free to, to hassle me on the uh, Reciprocate mailing list. Um, we've got the RFC 5766 turn server um, and the Jitsi turn server as well. So, and we've also got the SIPX Tappy. This is an alternative SIP stack, and we're using that to provide the media framework for conferencing. Um, in the future, we might look at doing that with the WebRTC media framework, which can run standalone as well in other applications. Um, is that provides more advanced codecs and other options for conferencing. Um, has anyone got any questions at this stage? Yep. I'll just wait for the microphone. Uh, has someone got the microphone? About <coughs> about um, browser compatibility with um, WebRTC, um, there is probably right now nothing in stable which would support WebRTC um, that, in terms of browsers. That's what backports is for. Right. Um, <laughs> and you, you mentioned the uh, possibility to use your smartphone, for example. You well, Android is installed on most on most. Um, do they um, come with such a browser, browser out of the box, or would they have to install the latest version of Firefox or something to use WebRTC? Like, um, how widespread would it be for a smartphone user to just use WebRTC to talk to someone? Okay, so for the smartphones, 
It's really a, an emerging thing. Um, Ericsson Research re released um, a browser, which they call Bowser, um, which, is a impl which supports WebRTC. Um, I haven't tried it extensively, and I, I can't say if it works or not, um, but that is out there, and, and that's worth a shot. Um, the, the whole thing is a moving target. Smartphone users are particularly likely to be behind that as well, and to have other connectivity problems. And while we're still sorting out WebRTC issues just on the normal office PCs and home PCs, then some of those mobile connectivity issues will probably come last. Like you can see that the support for turn over um, TLS has only just been realized with the latest release of, of Chrome from Google. And um, I haven't checked where Firefox is with that, but naturally they'll sort of try and follow what Chrome is doing to interoperate as much as possible. Um, but these things are still falling into place. With the original version of WebRTC in both browsers, you could only use UDP for your media streams. But now you can put your media stream in a TLS session through a proxy, um, which is a big step forward for connectivity with people on a restricted network. Um, so these things, I even when they're implemented in the desktop browsers, they might not follow in the mobile browsers right away. Um, so one reality is with the mobiles, people also have to look at dedicated apps rather than waiting for the features in the browser. Um, a lot of people have tried the non-free applications like Viber, for example. Lumicall aims to provide a similar sort of con level of convenience, but with a free, a genuinely free experience. Um, is it's open source. Um, people can install the app. They they register their user ID as their phone number um, so that they can immediately call other people just by knowing someone's number. They don't need to go and say, what's your user ID on Lumicall and start making up a list of all their friends. It's just, it's automatic. It's linked to their phone number. Um, these are the types of things that we can do to make it easier for people on mobile. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the situation with mobile. So I see that taking time to really settle down for the WebRTC in particular. We have other questions? Oh. Wookie, uh, microphone. What sort of resource do does running CIPRK on your server potentially take in terms of, is it tiny, enormous, might use a lot of bandwidth? Um, I mean, this thing costs about maybe 20 francs or $20, depending where you're from. Um, and you can run parts of Reciprocate on one of these. It's a very basic router. Um, so on a server, it's not very demanding. I mean, the Reciprocate stack actually runs on an Android device as well. Um, you can run the return server on a device like this to provide constant um, NAT traversal wherever you are. So if you have one of these in your home running the turn server and you're out on some odd network with your laptop or your mobile phone, then you can basically use turn to call home and to relay your media streams, um, which also gives you a level of privacy um, as well as the security that you can get through um, awkward network situations. So, so it's not a very demanding stack. It's been optimized quite extensively. On, on the other hand, it is a very full implementation of SIP and related standards. So it's not the smallest stack by any means, but it still runs well on, on small devices. So. End up uh, relaying, so there are considerations as to how much data you're sending through your box because the turn server ends up being an intermediary if it can't make a direct connection. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And it, it uses access control um, so that only authorized users can relay. Is there are situations, and it varies from country to country. Now, in, in some countries, virtually everyone 
has to relay their calls because their telecoms market is very regulated and they're very much afraid of these technologies. Um, and they have to set up VPNs and relay everything. In other countries, it's just a question of what hardware people have. People with very bad routers often find that they can't make proper calls without something relaying their calls for them. Um, so a turn server will help those users. Maybe one in 10 users will will need um, relaying in like a Western country at the moment. So have more questions? Yep. Um, so I see that it takes um, will take a bit more time until WebRTC becomes um, as ubiquitous as it would need to be to just tell somebody to go to that website. But imagine that would be the case. Um, for me, as somebody who would like to then use WebRTC, are there uh, standalone programs who do WebRTC and for which I would then not need to use my browser, which I only want to use for browsing and not video stuff, but a standalone application which would just be like other um, okay. calling applications but just would do WebRTC or multiple protocols for that matter. Okay, so. What you're saying is someone wants to call you. Yes, and I don't want to use my browser, but a standalone application. Does it yeah. exist? Does anyone here make soft phones? <laughs> um, Emil? If you give the microphone to... Hey, um, Emil from GT. So, um, the whole point of... I'm, I'm not sure if many of you here have tried coding with WebRTC, but basically the way it works is that you tell your browser, I, I imagine I, you've already said that, you tell your browser I want to do audio and video and then it generates a blob which is an SDP, uh, which I suppose you've already seen maybe. Uh, and the whole reason for using SDP was so that um, interoperability with other protocols such as SIP would be easier. So uh, one would hope that, yes, you would be able to do that. You would be able to uh, use a browser to connect to a, any SIP soft phone and receive calls without, uh, without you needing to start a browser. Now, that was a plan. Um, in reality, uh, things got a little bit more complicated than that um, because um, as, as you all know, uh, WebRTC requires a bunch of things that weren't necessarily available in uh, regular SIP soft phones, such as, for example, support for rice, and not just standard vanilla ice, but trickle ice, uh, support for bundles, support for DTLS. Uh, most of these things are currently unavailable in most soft phones today, really actually all of them. Um, now, what is going to happen most likely is that all of these cell phones are going to just adapt and uh, uh, implement the additional uh, protocols that they need to. This is what we are currently doing in Jitsi. We are implementing support for ice per SIP. We already had it for XMPP. Um, and uh, we are also working on, uh, on implementing ATLS. Today, however, there are already people who are using Jitsi through XMPP, through Jingle, uh, to, make, uh, to make calls to... Uh, to a browser and receive calls from a browser. So um, the short answer is eventually it would be possible. Today it is a little bit of a hassle. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are some unusual side effects of, of trying this. Um, uh, Catalin, have you got the Polycom phone there? Did you just pass me the Polycom phone? So, so one of the first things w that I did when I try WebRTC is to make a call from the browser to one of the regular phones I had on my desk. Um, so the SIP you know, relayed the call from the browser to the phone. And the phone crashed and rebooted itself immediately. <laughs> so. <laughs> So you have to be careful and you have to test these things before you roll them out in a commercial environment, for example. They, um, they do have this impact because the protocols are a moving target. Um, things are improving, but older devices will struggle with the newer protocols. So. 
Um, I'd just like to have one comment here. Um, the reason why some of these phones would still work today is because um, the WebRTC implementation is in Chrome today uses SDES for key negotiation for SRDP, um, which is the conventional way security was being handled and set for, for quite a while. Recently, a couple of weeks ago actually, the ITF agreed that SDES would not only be mandatory to implement, sorry, would not only not be mandatory to implement by WebRTC implementation, but it uh, must not be used by WebRTC implementation. So uh, all of these that actually supported SRDP on some, on some level are going to be, um, with their current implementation, obsolete. And uh, we would have to wait for firmware updates or for new versions of soft phones. There are a number, uh, just a simple answer to, to, the, to, to the question. Uh, Jitsi has, has only recently been introduced into Unstable. And do, do you want to come up the front? Yeah, yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's okay now. Yeah. G, uh, a simple answer to, 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 to the question. Jitsi has only now been introduced into Unstable, and it's not even yet in, it's too, it's too young, it's still too young uh, for, uh, for, for Jesse even. Um, there are a number of other soft phones, uh, probably of lesser quality, in, in still uh, already in the archive. Um, Lean phone, uh, SFL phone, which is um, awkward, but has most of the features. And um, yeah, and uh, what, uh, yeah, the, what was the other one? Um, but do they have DPLS? Um, SFL phone should have it, I think. Yeah, should have it. Uh, I tried it. I tried to configure it a while ago and was unsuccessful of using it. But sh there is a, a, a switch in the configuration panel. And there's also Yate that should function as a soft phone and a bit odd. And it doesn't, doesn't seem to have a complete, uh, complete uh, TLS support on, on the client side. Uh, 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 oh, DTLS? No, no, oh, DTLS? No. Yeah, just to, to give an example, um, I mean, empathy, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I can do too much about that. Yeah. Empathy is the default soft phone in the GNOME desktop, and during the testing phase of Wheezy, I discovered that Empathy was hard-coded to relay things via um, Google's turn servers, so that it wouldn't actually let you connect with the turn servers that are packaged in Debian. Um, so in about March, I opened a bug, just commenting that this may be against the privacy expectations <laughs> of many users. And I was, I was just surprised to see this taking on a whole new meaning with the things that have happened recently, that there probably are other soft phones that have hard-coded settings. Um, this is another area where it's important to have free and open source software because you, then you can go in and you can discover these things and you can say, well, look, that needs to change and you can change it. Um, so this is an opportunity to, to add a new configuration parameter to support any arbitrary turn server. So, so the current scenario, it's, it's constantly improving, but there's still little gotchas like this that you need to know about. So, um, we got more questions. Or? Also, an, uh, yep, Zachary. Okay. Also, another another ba basic comment. Um, all all the soft phones that we mentioned can do can do SIP, but it's it's. Uh, it can uh, un unencrypted SIP will work and will work well, but uh, I think maybe the, the basic assumption here for all of us is that this is not what we want, right? Hmm. I'm happy with plain text SIP. Making a phone call, 
Vita. Hello, rest of the world. For me, it's fine uh, that uh, plain zip uh, will be working. There's no hard demand for me to have encrypted audio streams. Okay. Have any other questions? Or? Zafri, do you want to tell people a little bit more about the asterisk situation in Debian? Um, a bit it more about uh, about asterisk and other packages. Um, okay, um, ab about some packages you didn't you didn't mention. Okay, uh, free switch. Uh, you mentioned free switch. Free switch is not yet in Debian. If you want to help uh, packaging it, please contact uh, me or Phil Hands uh, should be here in the room. Um, okay. Uh, asterisk uh, asterisk eleven is not yet packaged. It's it should hopefully be uploaded very soon. We're waiting on the uh, PJ project package to uh, it's it's now in the new queue. Uh, asterisk eleven is the uh, uh, version that support that finally supports uh, WebRTC and uh, all of those things. Though. Uh, uh, CPTL, uh, basic CPTLS support is already in the in the existing package uh, in in uh, Wizzy. Um More on that, we, uh, you didn't mention, but there's an exi uh, a third alternative not widely used called Yate. Um, it's it's there. It the the, the maintainers are are responsive to to patches, so. If you use it and have any problems, feel free to, to report bugs. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Well, our, our time is up, so thanks for coming along to the session. Um, if you have more questions, yeah, feel free to, to comment. Um, afterwards, we have a free RTC mailing list. Um, have a look at opentelecoms.org. You can find details of some of the mailing lists for discussion of the uh, general principles and also for specific projects um, and yeah, everyone will be more than happy to help you. So thanks again for coming to DebConf. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah.